everybody, and welcome back to Beware the Artist. I am Jeremy Jersa, and with us this week, we have Taha Heydari. Um, how are you doing today? I'm good. How are you? Thanks for having me. No problem. I'm doing pretty good, pretty good. So um, to start off, who are you and what do you do? Uh, I'm an artist, uh, originally from Iran, uh, a painter mainly, uh, but started making some weird videos and GIFs, GIFs, uh, whatever people call it. Uh, so I don't call myself multidisciplinary artist, but I started doing other things too, but mainly a painter, full-time painter uh, based in Baltimore. And that's it, yeah. Cool, cool, cool. Um, so when it comes to your studio practice, what themes do you find yourself exploring in your work? Uh, technology, um, I would say mainly focusing on image and image making, uh, uh, the media, uh, camera, printer, uh, screens. So I'm trying to think about them in the medium of painting. Great, great. So your, your images are, are so complex. It feels like there's so many layers and so much that really kind of goes into not only the mm -hmm. image sourcing, but um, the application of the images to the, the, the picture plane itself. Um, how do you actually go about starting a painting? Um, I keep archiving images. I, I collect them on my phone, my laptop. Um, and uh, some of them grab my attention. Some of them, there is something about them, mostly uh, the ones that somehow references some historical events or uh, something about technology itself. Uh, so I started with those. Uh, um, usually, uh, think about scale uh, and then using video projector and putting it there. And then when I have like overall sense of where the image ends and begins, uh, then I start rendering it, looking at my phone uh, and going, uh, I usually start like more representational being more faithful to the image. Uh, but as it goes, it gets more abstract, broken, pixelated, and glitchy. Yeah. So is it is it important for you to to look off of a screen rather than print out the image? Yeah, there is something about a screen and having it, and at the same time being able to flip it, zoom in, zoom out. Uh, uh, and it's different from it's different. RGB is different from CMYK, but somehow when it's a screen, uh, I prefer that. So what is the atmosphere like in your studio? Do you have music playing? Is it complete silence? Are there podcasts in the background? What's what's that like for you? Yeah, I used to listen to music a lot, ambient, uh, uh, electronic music. Uh, but these days, I uh, usually just podcasts uh, and listen to online courses. Um, and I would say mostly podcasts. Uh, uh, about history, about philosophy. Yeah. So what's uh, what's the podcast you got playing right now? What's on your playlist? Uh, philosophy in Our Time, BBC, I listen to that. Uh, um, I listen to New Models. Uh, I listen to Philosophize This. Nice, nice. So when I, when I first um, encountered your work, I was struck by the connection between digital media and the canvas and, and the screen and the canvas itself. Um, can you explain what it is that really captures your um, attention about this relationship? Uh, canvas and screen. Yeah. You, you said, yeah, something about painting. I mean, my dad is a painter growing up, always being around uh, painting. Uh, I have a hard time distinguish that from life, uh, the painting itself. Like I grew up inside a, a house that a painter uh, who teaches also painting uh, was my father, was my teacher. So that that was a dominant thing. And uh, so I see everything, every everyday life through painting. Uh, that's just uh, so, uh, and I'm, thinking about technology a lot 
uh, and find a very uh, ontological, like very deep uh, relationship between the medium of painting and uh, my phone. Uh, and the, uh, the simultaneity of being object and image, that's also fascinating me. Like, uh, um, and uh, yeah, the a whole concept of image making and the policy behind it, the history of image making, painting uh, 40,000 years old, maybe on the cave up to now, uh, and looking at these new media through this like very deep historical perspective. Uh, that's just interesting to me. I also, I, I find it really exciting um, how much you're open to kind of experimenting through your work. I feel as though it's it's constantly evolving in a, in a really rich way. Um, and then your interpretation of found imagery versus uh, kind of digital imagery and, and just using the language of painting. Um, can you speak to this relationship with kind of play and experimentation within your studio practice? Right, I, I keep looking at new ways of uh, thinking about painting and making painting. Uh, um, part of it comes from philosophy, uh, not taking anything as granted or just constantly thinking about the background, the platform, the tools that you're using, uh, nothing is granted. So nothing is given, so you have to kind of make it. Uh, so that's probably the foundation of it. It's this kind of lens that uh, it's more about uh, not exploring, but making, creating. Uh, so I constantly question my tools uh, as a thing, as constantly actively, like, why am I using this? Why do I use brushes? Or how can I change my brushes? Start cutting my brushes, burning my brushes, and then move to rollers. From that, I start using a lot of taping masking fluid. So I uh, constantly think about, okay, technology is evolving. Uh, iPhone 12 just came out, like, but painting is still the same. We are still using brushes. Like, how can I make some connections, conscious connections between these uh, constantly accelerating technology and this old medium? I, I love that interpretation that I, I've never really kind of I've never had that question in my studio, but now I think I'm going to questioning my tools themselves. Like, wh why am I using this tool to make this painting? I, I love that perspective. Um, so when you're, you've already kind of touched on it a little bit, you said you're, you're constantly sourcing and, and collecting images. Um, where are you finding these images? How are you collecting them? Mm. I spent a lot of time on social media. My average was eight hours on Instagram recently. Wow. Uh, yeah. Uh, so I'm online a lot. And I consider uh, this my second studio. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm constantly making sketches recently, uh, digital drawings. And uh, somehow they start from my phone. Uh, uh, reading news, I like, oh, wow, this is an interesting picture. I take picture from that uh going to another link click on the other one so it's just uh constantly unfolding uh uh layers and dimensions of internet it's just uh never ending so i'm just surfing on it and find things do you find um do you find yourself getting addicted at any point to to this process um just because social media itself by nature is just extremely addictive right, right it's seductive like internet is just uh uh yeah uh not in a bad way but mm -hmm. addiction in a, in a in a way that you're just like consuming constantly uh i don't yeah i don't have that negative thing that uh is uh I don't know, trendy now towards technology. Mm -hmm. I don't have that. So I don't, yeah, I like it. Yeah. Nice, nice. Um, so I want to take a moment to go back to some some older work uh, from 2011. Um, these are some of my, my favorite works and they're, they're the, the paintings that are paired with the clocks. Um, and I just want to kind of ask you how this pairing came about and, and what is going on with those works. 
are you referring to 2009, 2010, the, the maps and then a piece of clothing? The, um, they're, they're kind of black and white paintings that have somewhat blurred out images and then some are crisp paired with the actual right. physical clocks on the wall. Oh, I see, I see, yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, those are from 2011, the second show I did in Iran, a uh, solo show at Tara Hana Azad Gallery. Uh, yeah, I, right after uh, 2009-10 for a controversial election in Iran, there, Tehran, where I was living, was very tense. Uh, and uh, just living there and walking on the street and uh, being somehow suspicious of everything and everyone uh, because uh, uh, I don't know, uh, became very, very, my, it really changed my generation that mm -hmm. time in Iran. And uh, so I was trying to reflect on that, uh, constantly being under pressure or anxiety, even to the level of optical like to the level of sight, like wow. there is something optical happening. There is like uh, not trusting your eyes, like not trusting what you're seeing. Uh, and also it was the beginning of me being interested in technology uh, because uh, at that time, when something, a conflict happens, you want to see what's up and you keep watching the news. When you watch the news, government maybe don't like the news that you're watching. So they're sending noise to prevent you from watching those news. And when, when what, what you see on TV is just constantly glitchy, pixelated images that is the residue of two waves conflicting. So uh, and that that also kind of triggered my fascination with this optical side, mm. like seeing th things. Uh, uh, yeah, so I took out all the colors and just the whole show is about two men talking. And the, those clocks that you're referring to there, I changed the, uh, the engine or the machine. So the clocks were going uh, counterclockwise. Uh, and the show was called Last Night. It was about trying to remember what happened, but tragically we are left with uh, some illusion, black and white, two men. That's, that's brilliant. Um, just the, you know, the information and, and replicating that information and trying to piece things together. I, I really enjoy that concept. Um, so becoming, uh, moving to the United States, how did, how did that come about for you? Yeah. Um, America was on TV on, in Iran every day. So it wasn't, a, it wasn't a, it was a point of contrast for me, uh, being growing up for everyone, uh, to, the environment I grew up. Uh, so I was always curious overall, and then uh, decided to get out of Iran to see what's up uh, in bigger, broader art scene, uh, and also experiencing academic spaces outside of Iran. Uh, studied French for a year, wanted to go to Paris, but changed that uh, and uh, ended up here. Uh, yeah, I, I wanted to expose myself and uh, see where I am uh, globally versus just a smaller art scene in Tehran. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it happened, a lot of anxiety, but yeah, I'm, I'm glad I did it. Nice, nice. So post, um, post grad school, what made you want to stay in the, the Baltimore area? Mm -hmm. Well, um, I would say uh, community, MICA community, I had that. I did not know many people in the US, so I uh, decided to stay with them. And uh, although mo most of people moved to New York or Philly, but uh, the base was here, MICA was here. Uh, I knew places and also the rent uh, was af af affordable for me to just stay a full-time artist. Uh, I started teaching a few classes, but uh, I would say all these factors together made me stay in Baltimore. Nice. Yeah, I feel like it's 
it's such a welcoming community in, in the Baltimore area in a, in a really nice way. And it sets up a really great support system. So I'm glad that you're, you're experiencing that as well. Um, so let, I want to go back to the, the physical artwork itself for a moment. Um, how do you go about choosing the, the scale for your work? Because mm -hmm. it, it can be quite large. Yeah, you can. You can. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I, I'm not sure exactly what causes this very unconscious maybe when I see one image, I'm like, this is, this has a potential to uh, be blown up like this, uh, 12 feet. Uh, that, that, that gives me a sense of control and also insecurity when, mm -hmm. when sizes like that, uh, when you can control it it's just this kind of movement but when you have to put a ladder to go up it's your whole body is interacting with this that piece of canvas uh and you have this like macro macro uh level like you can zoom in and see all these details of, and then when you step back to see the whole thing you lose this, that you lose the micro I like that uh, when the image acknowledges your body and your location. Mm -hmm. I uh, I think it's interesting how you 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 physically, with your hands, kind of went m macro and micro in talking about the phone in the beginning of of our talk, uh, right. just zooming in and zooming out. Uh, it, it definitely has rewired us. Uh, I'm talking about the phone, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so. I also want to talk about some of your more more recent paintings. Um, I, I find myself personally getting lost in the the application of the paint and the kind of overlapping of of these kind of grid structures that are that are beginning to form this kind of cross hatching, um, and it, it feels to me very rooted in print media and mm. and screen printing in in a certain sense. Um, can you speak to how that layering process came about for you? Right. Uh, um, so new project that I'm working on right now is focused on um, uh, a specific magazine in Iran uh, was publishing uh, pre-revolution mostly, but then it started continue after revolution. Uh, Zane Ruz, which literally means uh, woman of today or woman today. Uh, it was about fashion and uh, women and uh, Western advertisement products. Uh, so I started focusing on that and thinking about uh, magazines, those magazines, uh, you're right about the print and press machines or old technology of uh, printing. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to get that quality thinking about those magazines were published uh, pre 1978, so different technology, different printing, but then I have it today on my iCloud, mm. uh, turned to algorithm or codes. Uh, uh, but at the same time, someone has it on the print in Iran uh, in their closet. Uh, right, so right. I'm thinking about all of that, the level of existence, simultaneity of these. Uh, and when I paint one, which one I paint, it's it's uh, the one on my iCloud, on my phone or my laptop, physical thing in Iran. Uh, so that's that's when you see these grid like, at the same time thick paint. Mm -hmm. So I'm kind of trying to reference all of that. Brilliant, brilliant. Um, and I know you started to touch on this a little bit earlier, um, but your your father was a painter as well. Um, so you kind of grew up in this artistic environment. Um, but at what point in your life did you start to kind of call yourself an artist? Mm. Right. Uh, uh, yeah, I don't usually, I get this question uh, often and I don't know how to approach it because uh, I've been uh, privileged living with an artist, like growing up and I never felt like art was a thing, an entity outside of me that I walked into. Uh, mm -hmm. It was always here. Uh, I, it wasn't a con conscious decision. Uh, always, it was always here uh, uh, growing up. Uh, so I, I honestly cannot recall a time 
at, I was like, oh, I'm, I guess I'm an artist. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's brilliant. That's brilliant. Um, so, you know, everyone is working with this mass pandemic of the pandemic um, of COVID. How has it been for you um, working during the time of COVID? Oh, boy. Uh, 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 yeah, they shut down this building around April last year uh, because it belongs to the city. Uh, so I didn't have a studio. Uh, I had to start drawing at home. So that's that was a new thing for me. I was not drawing uh, before that for a long time, uh, more than 15 years. Drawing wasn't a thing. Mm. Uh, so started drawing, uh, that was a, a positive thing that came out of this mess. Uh, and then, but overall, like the collapse of basically art art market yeah uh, or like people not being able to really look at art because they were engaged with like basic life things uh my show got canceled uh, a show that i was working on almost for a year and then uh then be, if you are a full-time artist painter you heavily rely on selling so that was a challenge also uh it, yeah i guess i need at least a year to reflect on what really happened yeah uh, yeah 20 yeah i understand that completely i mean it's still it's still hard you know, I know. Yeah. um so with that being said um I like to ask this question to everyone that has um, kind of been on the show and it's, it's kind of interesting what kind of comes through in this, but if there is one piece of art that you have to see in the world before you die, what does that work? <laughs> oh boy. I've never thought about that. It's a pretty big question. <laughs> No, uh, oh boy, uh, I honestly, I don't have an answer for that. I'm, I'm, yeah, I, I'm romantic about art, but not that romantic to have mm -hmm. like one, you know what I mean? Uh, I do, I do, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I, there are artists I love, but I, there is not like one piece, you know? Yeah. I, I feel like that's, that's the, the common answer. Um, because as artists, we, we love to see it all and we're always open to it all. So, um, just narrowing it down. How do you, how do you do that? That's like saying, what's the best you know, tasting I'm, water? I'm you know? trying, I couldn't do it. Yeah. Um, I think that is kind of the perfect place to kind of wrap things up. So if people are looking for your work, where might they be able to find it? Um, I have a website I'm working on. It. It's not great. Uh, Tahaheydari.com. And my Instagram, uh, I have two accounts. Uh, one of them are my paintings. I uh, update. Uh, I would say twice a month, but like the other one that I'm on eight hours a day is the one that I make videos, uh, uh, Taha, Taha.a. Okay, great, great, great. Taha, it's been an absolute pleasure having you on. I really enjoyed this conversation. Um, everyone, if you haven't checked out Taha's work, make sure you do that as soon as possible. Um, and I will see you all on our next episode. All right, awesome. see you later. Yeah.